Hello everyone, this is Brother Carl Tester and in this, what I hope will be short presentation, I'm going to talk about this biblical phrase, for God hath not appointed us unto wrath. These words are taken from 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 9 and are quite easy to interpret and understand. However, like anything else that we find in the Bible, if we have a preconceived idea about biblical matters, we can make a verse or a passage mean whatever it needs to be in order to reinforce our preconceived idea. This very problem exists in relation to this phrase, for God hath not appointed us unto wrath. Let us examine ourselves and be honest. We all have a strong tendency to wear religious glasses when reading the Word of God. These glasses are acquired as a result of the church we attend, the doctrinal slant of that church, what we have believed all of our lives, and so on. These things can, and often do, colour and distort what the scriptures are really saying. We become quite comfortable with religious classes as we don't really want to find anything that challenges us, and we most certainly don't want to find things that contradict what we believe the Bible is meant to say. Futurism, otherwise known as dispensational theology, the view of a coming seven years of great tribulation, called by the adherents to this view, the great tribulation. And by the way, the phrase, the great tribulation, occurs nowhere in the scriptures. The scriptures only talk about tribulation. The view is that before the great tribula tribulation, the church will be raptured out of here into heaven, leaving the world in the hands of a one-man antichrist who is going to rule from a rebuilt Jewish temple in the Middle East, and so on. My purpose is not to review the ins and outs of futurism, but rather I'm going to be focusing on 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 9 and show how that this scripture is misconstrued, taken out of context, and made to mean something it plainly does not say. This is the result of wearing religious glasses which contain the rapture lens option available in most churches near you. This is a true saying. Wonderful things in the Bible I see, things placed there by you and by me. I'm not going to read all of 1 Thessalonians 5, but we'll just read a few verses to get the gist of the chapter, starting in verse 1. But of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. Down to verse 8. But let us who are of the day, be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for an helmet, the hope of salvation. Verse 9, For God hath not appointed us unto wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that, whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together, and edify one another, even as also ye do. So this chapter is quite straightforward. It reminds us of the coming of the day of the Lord, the coming of which would be sudden, like a thief in the night, an exhortation and comfort that we should not be in fear because we have not been appointed unto wrath, but unto salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now the futurists tell us that 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 9 is a rapture proof text. They say that the meaning of this phrase, for God hath not appointed us unto wrath, is a reference to seven years of great tribulation coming upon the world at some point in the future. This is the wrath of God, this is the great tribulation, and as we have not been appointed unto this, the only explanation can be that we have been raptured out of here during this period. The thought continues that if the church was here during this great tribulation, they would have to suffer. God can't punish one group without punishing everyone. Now, nothing remotely like that is stated anywhere in this chapter, and so this thinking is all read into this verse, 
and this is a result from wearing or a result of wearing religious glasses pure and simple. In looking at this matter, let's establish some basic principles so that you may understand where I am coming from and no doubt you will agree with these. Firstly, every point of Christian doctrine must be open to and must be able to withstand honest scrutiny. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 21 Prove all things, hold fast that which is good. Secondly, in order to establish doctrine, there must be at least two or three scriptural witnesses. Deuteronomy 19 verse 15 At the mouth of two witnesses or at the mouth of three witnesses shall the matter be established. Paul refers to this pr principle in 2 Corinthians 13 verse 1, so we have a New Testament reference as well. Thirdly, the Bible does not contradict itself, and so the Bible must be allowed to interpret itself. John 10 verse 35, the scripture cannot be broken. Amen. Now let's think about all of the biblical references the witnesses that we need which will show or which show that God removes his people from the earth, takes them to heaven as a precursor to pouring out his wrath upon the inhabitants of the earth. Remember, we need at least two or three. Now, here are the biblical witnesses. Uh, hang on. There aren't any witnesses. There's not even one. This should raise a red flag to the adherents of futurism. This automatically shows us that there is a significant problem with this kind of understanding in connection with this verse, and one should now want to know what's going on. What does this passage mean if it doesn't mean what we are told by the futurists? Now, what if we found two or three witnesses to show us the reverse of this popular understanding? Biblical passages that clearly show that God preserves his people on earth while at the same time pouring out his great wrath upon the inhabitants of the earth. Would we be prepared to believe God's word or would we have to stick with our view, our religious glasses, our understanding of what we think the Bible means to say? Firstly, let's go to the witness of the days of Noah, the time when God's fury and wrath was poured out upon the world. That's going to be an ideal comparative passage to give us a good idea uh, concerning what will happen at the end of this age. We read in Matthew 24, picking it up in verse 37, But as the days of Noah were, so shall it also be so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. So we can see here, it's an ideal comparative passage. Verse 38, For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. The futurist view of 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 9 is that the righteous are taken out of the world while the wicked remain. What we have just read here, the Bible is saying, As the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. In the days of Noah, who was taken away and who was left behind? We don't even need to guess. It was the wicked who were taken away, Genesis 7 verse 23, and every living substance was destroyed which was upon the face of the ground, both man and cattle and creeping things and the fowl of the heaven, and they were destroyed from the earth. And it was the righteous who remained, Genesis 7 verse 23, and Noah only remained alive and they that were with him in the ark. This is very straightforward and free from any argument. The fierce wrath of God was poured out upon the world and God did not need to take Noah and his family out of this world to save them. 
the waters that destroyed the world were the same waters that lifted Noah up upon the earth and preserved him and his family. And remember, as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Following the days of Noah, the scriptures give us the example of the days of Lot in Luke 17 verse 28. Likewise also as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they builded. But the same day that Lot went out from Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Clearly, in the days of Lot, God also took away the wicked from the land completely destroyed them all, and only Lot and his two daughters remained. Lot and his family remained on earth, while the wicked were removed from earth. The story of the children of Israel in Egypt is another clear example of God pouring out his terrible wrath, this time upon an entire nation, while at the same time preserving his people within that same nation. Wonderful! Ten plagues were poured out upon Egypt, and concerning three of these plagues, it is specifically stated that the children of Israel were free from the dreadful effects of these. We read in Exodus 7 verse 22, And I will sever in that day the land of Goshen, in which my people dwell, that no swarms of flies shall be there, to the end that thou mayest know that I am the Lord in the midst of the earth. Down in Exodus 9, verse 25, And the hail smote throughout all the land of Egypt, all that was in the field, both man and beast, and the hail smote every herb of the field, and brake every tree of the field. Only in the land of Goshen, where the children of Israel were, was there no hail. Then over in Exodus 10, verse 22, And Moses stretched forth his hand toward heaven, and there was a thick darkness in all the land of Egypt three days. They saw not one another, neither rose any from his place for three days, but all the children of Israel had light in their dwellings. Wonderful! And then, of course, there is also the tenth and worst of all of these plagues, of the great wrath of God being poured out, and that was when the Lord passed over the land of Egypt. No, it was not a death angel that passed over Egypt, as so many say it was. It was the Lord himself. It was his great wrath. He passed over and slew all the firstborn males of both men and beast. Only the children of Israel who were in the midst of this great outpouring of his wrath, the children of Israel were spared, who had the blood of the lamb over the door and on the side posts. Exodus 12, verse 23, For the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians, and when he seeth the blood upon the lintel and on the two side posts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not suffer the destroyer to come in unto your houses to smite you. This is simply stupendous. God keeps his people on earth. There is no need to take them out of this world, but rather God keeps his people through great tribulation, through the outpouring of his fierce wrath. They had the blood of the lamb back then that saved them. We have the blood of Jesus. How much more is God able to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by Jesus Christ? seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. And how can this be? The scripture has told us, For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by, by our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The story is the same during the days of the fall of Jericho. In Joshua 2 verse 15 we read the story of uh, Rahab and how she saved the spies by letting him down letting them down by a cord through the window. And then it specifically tells us in that verse, for her house was upon the town wall and she dwelt, dwelt upon the wall. Now, what was the very thing that was going to be thrown down in order to allow the children of Israel to take the city of Jericho? Joshua 6 verse 5 tells us that the walls of the city were going to fall down flat. 
in Joshua 6 verse 20, it tells us that the people heard the sound of the trumpet and the people shouted with a great shout and the wall fell down flat. But then it tells us in that same chapter in verse 25, and Joshua saved Rahab the harlot alive and her father's household and all she had and she dwelt in Israel even unto this day because she hid the messengers which Joshua sent to spy out Jericho. Amazing. God threw down the walls of Jericho, yet preserved the family of Rahab, whose house was built upon that very same wall. No one was taken out of this world. But once again, God kept his people at the very center of the pouring out of his fierce wrath and judgment. Now let's just remind ourselves what it says in the New Testament, Paul speaking in 1 Corinthians 10 verse 11. Now all these things happen unto them for examples, and they were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Clearly, we are intended to take what we have been reading and apply it to this New Testament, New Covenant setting in which we now live. There is simply no scope to develop an interpretation of Scripture that is the exact reverse of what the Bible is actually teaching. In a slightly different but related example, we can consider the persecution and attempted burning of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. And this gives us a, another example of God's people who were brought through great tribulation. In this example, it is not the wrath of God, so I want to be transparent about that. It is not the wrath of God at work, but rather it is the wrath of man. The fiery wrath of King Nebuchadnezzar, king of the world empire of the day, the Babylonians. This story highlights how the very situation that was meant for the destruction of God's people was to be the means for their salvation and the death of God's enemies. It shows us how that God can deal simultaneously in a situation, delivering his own and destroying his enemies. There is simply no need to take anybody away into heaven. The guards that threw these three into the fire perished. Daniel 3 verse 22. And the furnace was exceeding hot. The flames of the fire slew those men that took up Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. In verse 23, and these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down bound into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Then in verse 25, Nebuchadnezzar said, Lo, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. The three were cast into the fire, but the only thing that the fire destroyed was their bonds. And also, Jesus was with them, even to the end. Jesus was with them through this ordeal and preserved his own. And don't you think that this very same thing is going to happen at the end? I think so. That is what the Bible is telling us. We have not been appointed unto wrath, but unto salvation. A somewhat similar situation occurs over again in Daniel chapter 6 with the story of Daniel in the lion's den. And I'm not going to read that story out because I'm sure you know it well. The point here is that the den of lions that was to have devoured Daniel, preserved Daniel, but devoured his enemies. Once again, it's simply no problem for God to use the very same situation to protect his people on the one hand and destroy his enemies on the other. In Exodus 14, we see that the pillar of the cloud that was with the children of Israel at the time of the crossing of the Red Sea was light for the Israelites, but caused darkness to the Egyptians because Israel was appointed unto salvation and Egypt was appointed unto destruction. Amen. The promises of God are consistent. We read from Psalm 91 verse 1, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Verse 3, Surely he shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. He shall cover thee with his feathers, and under his wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid of the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flieth by day 
nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. Are you worried about all this COVID-19 and Delta variants and Chinese virus and so on? Don't worry, trust in the Lord. A thousand shall fall at thy side and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. How can this be? Because we have not been appointed unto wrath, but unto salvation. Amen. Verse 8. Only with thine eyes shalt thou behold and see the reward of the wicked, because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the Most High, thy habitation. There shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. Amen. Proverbs 10 verse 30 says, The righteous shall never be removed but the wicked shall not inhabit the earth. The righteous remain, the wicked are removed. Let us consider Jesus Christ, the author and finisher of our faith. While going through the greatest tribulation ever, far greater than what you and I will ever be called upon to endure, and about to suffer the fierceness of the great anger and wrath of God, that great anger and wrath that is against all sin and unrighteousness, while in the midst of this great tribulation, whilst on earth, Jesus said these words while praying in the garden of Gethsemane just before he was taken by the temple guards. John 17 verse 15, I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from evil. And in case you think that these words were just for the disciples back then, Jesus says down in verse 20, Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. That's you and I. Now if Jesus Christ, our great high priest, prayed that we should not be taken out of the world, what chance does Anybody who believes in Jesus Christ, what chance does anyone have that they will be raptured out of here during Great Tribulation? And the answer to that is there is absolutely no possibility whatsoever. The Bible deals with this matter consistently throughout. Psalm 37 verse 9, For evildoers shall be cut off, but those that wait upon the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. For yet a little while, and the wicked shall not be. Yea, thou shalt diligently consider his place, and it shall not be. But the meek shall inherit the earth, and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. Down in verse 28. For the Lord loveth judgment, and, for, and forsaketh not his saints. They are preserved forever, but the seed of the wicked shall be cut off. The righteous shall inherit the land and dwell therein forever, because the righteous shall never be removed. Amen. Going to verse 34. Wait on the Lord and keep his way, and he shall exalt thee to inherit the land. When the wicked are cut off, thou shalt see it. It's just so consistent the whole time. The righteous remain, the wicked are removed. They're cut off, they are taken out of the way. Verse 35, I have seen the wicked in great power and spreading himself like a green bay tree. Yet he passed away and lo, he was not. Yea, I sought him, but he could not be found. Mark the perfect man and behold the upright for the end of that man is peace. Verse 38, but the transgressors shall be destroyed together. The end of the wicked shall be cut off. But the salvation of the righteous is of the Lord. He is their strength in time of trouble. And the Lord shall help them and deliver them. He shall deliver them from the wicked and save them because they trust in him. And we have not been appointed unto wrath, but unto salvation in Christ Jesus our Lord. Praise the Lord. Isaiah 43 verse 2. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. God doesn't take us out of these problems. God doesn't take us over the problems. God doesn't take us under the problems. God takes us through all the trial, all the difficulty, 
all the tribulation and he will take us through to the other side. And as somebody else said, God will pull you through. You've just got to hang on for the pull through. Amen. This exact same thought is found in Jeremiah 2 verse 5. Thus saith the Lord, What iniquity have your fathers found in me, that they are gone far from me, and have walked after vanity, and are become vain? Verse 6, Neither said they, Where is the Lord that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, that led us through the wilderness, through a land of deserts and of pits, through a land of drought, and of the shadow of death, through a land that no man passed through and where no man dwelt and i brought you into a plentiful country to eat the fruit thereof and the goodness thereof again god didn't take his people out of any of the problems he took them all through praise the lord one of the principal emphasis of futurism is the getting out of here away into heaven and what we have been seeing is that God will take us through whatever the problem and difficulty is before us. Can you imagine David facing Goliath and running away? What did David do? He ran towards Goliath. Psalm 18 verse 25, 29 For by thee have I run through a troop, praise the Lord, and by my God have I leaped over a wall. It's time to man up and realize that God has called us here to stay and he will take us through whatever the problems are that are going to befall this earth. Praise the Lord. Zechariah 13 verse 8 And it shall come to pass that in all the land, saith the Lord, two parts therein shall be cut off and die, but the third part shall be left therein. And I will bring the third part through the fire, and will refine them as silver is refined, and will try them as gold is tried. They shall call on my name, and I will hear them. I will say, It is my people, and they shall say, The Lord is my God. Who gets cut off? Quite obviously, it is the wicked. Who is being left behind? Equally obvious, it is the righteous. And then it says in verse 9 concerning the righteous, this third part, they're going to go through the fire. They're going to go through problems, tribulation, difficulty. But have they been appointed unto wrath? No, it is the wicked that have been appointed unto wrath. And God who has appointed his people unto salvation will bring them through. He will say, it is my people and they shall say, the Lord is my God. Amen. Psalm 23 verse 4, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'm not taken out of this world. I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me. Where is this table prepared? In the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over we are both together the righteous and the unrighteous together nobody goes anywhere but god deals with the enemies and he takes them out of the way the wicked shall be removed and the righteous shall remain amen in matthew 13 we read about the parable of the good seed and the tares that were sown into the field and the field is that symbol which represents the world in matthew 13 verse 27 so the servants of the household came and said unto him sir didst not thou sow good seed in thy field from whence then hath it tares he said unto them an enemy hath done this the servant said unto him wilt thou then that we go and gather them up but he said nay lest while ye gather up the tares ye root up also the wheat with them let both grow together until the harvest and in the time of the harvest i will say to the reapers gather ye together first the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them but gather the wheat into my barn this harvest is the end of the world or age it would be more correct to say at this point the tares are first gathered and removed but the wheat the righteous remain on the earth. Praise the Lord. The righteous do not get taken away. They shall never be removed. 
still in Matthew 13, but now going to verse 47. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a net that was cast into the sea and gathered of every kind, which, when it was full, they drew to shore and sat down and gathered the good into vessels, but cast the bad away. So shall it be at the end of the world, the angel shall come forth and sever the wicked from among the just, and shall cast them into the furnace of fire, there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. So we have seen that the meaning of 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 9 has nothing whatsoever to do with a supposed rapture of the saints to heaven while God pours out his wrath on earth. The saints are going nowhere, it's only the wicked who will be taken out of the way, praise the Lord. Now let's look further at the simplicity of the meaning of this verse in a New Testament context. Well, it's quite simple. The reason why we are not appointed unto wrath but unto salvation is because, as an example, Colossians 1 verse 13, Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, that is Jesus Christ, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. That's one basic reason. God hath not appointed us unto wrath, but he most certainly has appointed the wicked unto wrath. Romans 1 verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. The wrath of God is for those who have rejected salvation through the only Saviour, even the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is a most fearful thing indeed, to reject the only Saviour, the way, the truth, the life. But because we have been saved, we have been born of water and of the Spirit through Jesus Christ, we have been appointed unto salvation by the very same. Praise ye the Lord. To the unbelieving and Christ-rejecting, Paul says in Romans 2 verse 5, But after thy hardness and impenitent heart treasurest up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. Romans 5 verse 9, Much more then being now justified by his blood, look at this, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Praise the Lord, wonderful things. Talking about godly leaders, Paul says in Romans 13 verse 4, For he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain, for he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Paul says in Ephesians 2 verse 3, Among whom also we had our conversation in times past, in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and we were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. We had been appointed unto wrath, but now through Jesus Christ we are destined for salvation. Praise the Lord. Amen. Paul says, don't let anyone deceive you. Ephesians 5 verse 6, let no man deceive you with vain words. For because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Colossians 3 verse 5 Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. For which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. 1 Thessalonians 1 verse 9 For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how ye turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. Wonderful, praise the Lord, it's just so simple. 1 Thessalonians 2 verse 14 For ye... Brethren, became followers of the churches of God, which in Judea are in Christ Jesus. For ye also have suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews, who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets, and have persecuted us, and they please not God, and are contrary to all men. 
forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved, to fill up their sins always, for the wrath is come upon them to the uttermost. They have been appointed unto the wrath of God, but we who are saved in Christ Jesus have been appointed unto salvation. Amen. Hebrews 3 verse 11 gives a warning to God's people. Don't refuse him. Don't fall back in unbelief. Don't be disobedient. We read in Hebrews 3 verse 11, So I swear in my wrath they shall not enter into my rest. Revelation 6 verse 15, And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man, hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? Here we see that it is the wicked who are trembling in whatever station in life they may be. Kings, great men, rich men, captains, mighty men, slave or free. And in answer to the question in verse 17, who shall be able to stand? It is quite obvious. It is those who are in Christ Jesus because they have been appointed unto salvation. Amen. Revelation 16 verse 19, And the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. And great Babylon came in remembrance before God, to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. Who is to receive the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath? That great city, great Babylon. But we have not been appointed unto wrath, but unto salvation. It is truly a fearful thing to be without the blood of the Lamb, to be without Jesus Christ as the only Saviour. Revelation 19 verse 15, And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. There is much manipulation and changing of the meaning of the words of God. And we have only looked at one example in this presentation. The book of Revelation closes with this well-known warning to which we all do well to take heed. In Revelation 22 verse 18, For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And that is the wrath of God, and we don't want to be on the receiving end of that. Verse 19, And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life, and out of the holy city, and from the things which are written in this book. Amen. Now, as I conclude, I want to make it absolutely clear that I am not suggesting for one moment that Christians will not go through great tribulation. Far, far from it. Christians can and do go through great tribulation, sometimes the greatest of all, and they are put to death for their testimony and for their love of the Word of God. 1 Peter 4, verse 12, Beloved, Think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, not might try you, but which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened to you. But rejoice, inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, and he suffered greatly. Inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. The purpose of this presentation is to show the proper meaning of 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 9, which we have done, because we have not been appointed unto wrath, but unto salvation through Christ Jesus our Lord. Praise his name. For further related study concerning this matter, you may also wish to view my series called An Examination of Preterism and Other Things. And starting in part two, you will find an explanation of the different approaches to prophetic interpretation and their origins. And this includes an examination of the popular futurist school of eschatology. 
Then there's also the series called the Rapture Controversy and also the series called The Revelation of Jesus Christ and I commend those to you for your edification. I am going to conclude this presentation here. We have seen that the proper meaning of 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 9 has to do with the fact that we have been saved from the wrath of God through our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. This verse has nothing whatsoever to do with an imagined rapture, and those that teach this are simply changing the meaning of the Word of God to fit a preconceived narrative. They are wearing religious glasses. I hope that this presentation is helpful to you and a blessing, and may God use it somehow, somewhere, to help brothers and sisters in the Lord to turn from this great deception unto the truth that is found in the Word of God. Amen, and God bless you. Until next time.